And that brings us to the next thing, which are thoughts. Thoughts are really interesting because in many ways they're like perceptions, except that they draw on not just what's happening in the present, but also things we remember from the past and things that we anticipate about the future. The other thing about thoughts that's really interesting is that thoughts can be both reflexive, they can just be occurring all the time, sort of like pop-up windows on a poorly filtered web browser, or they can be deliberate. We can decide to have a thought. In fact, right now you could decide to have a thought just like you would decide to write something out on a piece of paper. You could decide that you're listening to a podcast, that you are in a particular location. You're not just paying attention to what's happening, you're directing your thought process. And a lot of people don't understand or at least appreciate that the thought patterns and the neural circuits that underlie thoughts can actually be controlled in this deliberate way. And then finally, there are actions. Actions or behaviors are perhaps the most important aspect to our nervous system. Because first of all, our behaviors are actually the only thing that are going to create any fossil record of our existence. You know, after we die, the nervous system deteriorates, our skeleton will remain. But it's, you know, in the moment of, of experiencing something very joyful or something very sad, it can feel so all encompassing that we actually think that it has some meaning beyond that moment. But actually for humans, and I think for all species, the sensations, the perceptions, and the thoughts, and the feelings that we have in our lifespan, none of that is actually carried forward, except the ones that we take and we convert into actions such as writing, actions such as words, actions such as engineering new things. And so the fossil record of our species and of each one of us is really through action. And that in part is why so much of our nervous system is devoted to converting sensation, perceptions, feelings, and thoughts into actions. In fact, the great neuroscientist or physiologist, Sherrington, won a Nobel Prize for his work in mapping some of the circuitry, the connections between nerve cells that give rise to movement. And he said, movement is the final common pathway. The other way to think about it is that one of the reasons that our central nervous system, our brain and spinal cord, include this stuff in our skull, but also connect so heavily to the body is because most everything that we experience, including our thoughts and feelings, was really designed to either impact our behavior or not. And the fact that thoughts allow us to reach into the past and anticipate the future and not just experience what's happening in the moment gave rise to an incredible capacity for us to engage in behaviors that are not just for the moment. They're based on things that we know from the past and that we would like to see in the future. And this aspect to our nervous system of creating movement occurs through some very simple pathways. Um, the reflexive pathway basically includes areas of the brainstem we call central pattern generators. When you walk, provided you already know how to walk, you are basically walking because you have these central pattern generators, groups of neurons that generate right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot kind of movement. However, when you decide to move in a particular deliberate way that requires a little more attention, you start to engage areas of your brain for top-down processing where your forebrain works from the top down to control those central pattern generators so that maybe it's right foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, right foot, left foot, if maybe you're hiking along some rocks or something and you have to engage in that kind of movement. So movement is just like thoughts, can be either reflexive or deliberate. And when we talk about deliberate, I wanna be very specific about how your brain works in a deliberate way because it give, gives rise to a very important feature of the nervous system that we're gonna talk about next, which is your ability to change your nervous system. And what I'd like to center on for a second is this notion of what does it mean for the nervous system to do something deliberately? Well, when you do something deliberately, you pay attention, you are bringing your perception to an analysis of three things. Duration, how long something is gonna take or should be done. Path, what you should be doing an outcome. If you do something for a given length of time, what's going to happen? Now, when you're walking down the street or you're eating or you're just talking reflexively, you're not doing this, what I call DPO, duration path outcome type of deliberate function in your brain and nervous system. But the moment you decide to learn something or to resist speaking or to speak up when you would rather be quiet, 
anytime you're deliberately kind of forcing yourself over a threshold, you're engaging these brain circuits and these nervous system circuits that suddenly make it feel as if something is challenging, something has changed. Well, what's changed? What's changed is that when you engage in this duration path and outcome type of uh, thinking or behavior or way of being, you start to recruit these neuromodulators that are released from particular areas of your brain and also it turns out from your body and they start cueing to your nervous system, something's different, something's different now about what I'm doing, something's different about what I'm feeling, 